evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Full Metal Tuxedo Podcast. I am Gregory, of course, your host. If uh, this is your first time, remember, I live stream these onto Armored Gregory, and then I upload an edited version of that onto the Armored Media channel. So uh, I got a random burst of inspiration last night, right at about midnight. <laughs> And I was up till about 3 a.m. Uh, writing the outline for two videos for the Armored Skeptic channel, my main channel, and obviously an outline for today's podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about how the future is a lie, at least the, the future that we're sold on television. I mentioned this a little bit last time we did a podcast here. I mentioned some of my problems with Elon Musk and some of my problems with the metaverse and online shopping and... The way that corporations are going to be tracking our purchases and problems with the brain chip and how it basically just allows AI and, again, these corporate overlords direct access to your brain. And they can literally affect your mood and maybe even your thoughts. It's not hyperbole. It's all real. Well, I... I guess I just didn't get over that thought <laughs> after I brought it up last time because, I don't know, I've always meant to make a skeptic video about the future, about the the new space race, Elon Musk versus Jeff Bezos, Tesla, SpaceX, and I, I guess I just didn't really know how I was going to focus my thoughts on that. So tonight is sort of just a warm-up. I don't think my next Armored Skeptic video is going to be about this, but it's this is definitely a warm-up for when this video comes out. Because, I'm again, I'm just trying to sort of collect my thoughts on this. And the challenge with Armored Skeptic, I think I have this very specific style of writing and presentation where I like to reveal things, and I like there to be sort of a punch point at the end. And it's not always so obvious to me how I'm going to make that work. And I don't know that I have like a punch point at the end of this one, but I, I just have a bunch of really good points, though. Well, I guess I should say you can be the judge of that, but we all know my ego. I'm just going to say that I'm the best and you have to accept that. Before we get started, I have to thank Samtar. Samtar is the musician that provides the music for this podcast. Check out Samtar's channel. I always have a link in the description. So what got me started thinking about this, actually, is the whole Mickey Mouse copyright thing. If you uh, don't pay attention to art, and <laughs> if you don't pay, <laughs> like, Disney is art. Disney is art. But if you don't pay attention to the, the art in the media, every once in a while... A nice little piece of media cracks past that expiration date on exclusive copyright claims. And it becomes essentially public domain. Mickey Mouse is just about to crack past that point. Mickey Mouse is arguably one of the most iconic characters in modern history. Everyone knows who Mickey Mouse is. He's probably featured in more tattoos than any other character even. And Walt Disney, of course, has been very stingy about the way that they let other people use Mickey. Famously, he and Bugs Bunny featured together in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That is one of my all-time favorite films. Of course, you guys know I love animation. <laughs> I've uh, been doing animation for quite a long time. I'm so proficient with my specific punk found art version of animation that I do that I tend to forget even that I am an animator. I never even bring that up when I tell people what I do. But I'm a f***ing animator, guys. <laughs> and I guess I just really appreciate that film, Who Framed Roger Rabbit?, because of the way that it was able to recontextualize basically all of these iconic characters that we all grew up with. Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse were both very important to me as a child. I think I've derived a lot of my humor from Bugs Bunny. I think that he probably still makes me laugh. But the thing is that that kind of thing may never or probably never will happen again. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was lightning in a bottle because... It was the one and possibly only time Warner Brothers and Disney 
ever properly agreed on anything. And it's because they both gave over creative control of their characters to a third party who also demonstrated that they love these characters. And their sequence together is one of the, you know, funniest in the entire series. Actually, no. S scratch that. When the, the dueling pianos between the two ducks, that's way funnier. Anyways, the point I'm getting to. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, once he eventually becomes public domain, if this happens, you know, there's a big if because we don't know. It's possible because it is sort of unprecedented just how iconic a character he is, Disney might be given some sort of special dispensation to hold on to the copyright longer. Who knows what's going to happen. But if it's released, what that means is basically anything that anyone writes or draws or animates or produces with Mickey Mouse after that point, technically we could consider canonical. We could consider it canon to Mickey. It's whatever we decide is the real Mickey from that point on. And that sounds arbitrary, but that's one of the main reasons why people are so protective of their copyrights. The other one, of course, is just that it mad, mad money. Mickey Mouse is representative of multiple hundreds of billions of dollars. God, oh God, I, it's, I shudder to think how much money Mickey Mouse has earned. God damn. It'd probably make me want to punch a hole in the crust of the earth. We could end up with a whole new era of Mickey Mouse and, of course, other members of the gang once they eventually crack past the copyright as well. And we might end up with some really interesting lore from sources that you might not have ever considered. Like some legitimate Peter Jackson level shit. Who knows what could come from it? It's not just a new era of art. It's like, it's an era of shared art. That's what it would start. Because we do have other characters we can share, but none that we all know the way we know Mickey. I guess, you know, there's like Zeus, Thor, what have you, but, you know, ancient mythology is sort of tired. Pe people don't seem to be as interested in that as I am. <laughs> but Mickey Mouse is still relevant today. People still watch Mickey Mouse related content. And it might even revitalize the character. Make him more relevant again. In a shared art era. It would totally change the way that we see this kind of entertainment. It would be just like memes. Exactly like memes. Richard Dawkins, this is something that I almost always forget. Richard Dawkins is the one that coined the term meme. He basically described it as anything that's repeating and shared, as it were. But memes were still sort of in their infancy, at least the art form of memeing that we know today was still just coming out of the primordial ooze. He couldn't have known at that time how complex and prolific an art form memeing would become. How it would be pervasive in all forms of our culture, all levels of our culture. The art of memeing is basically complex to the point of being indescribable. I mean, a basic meme, if you think about it, is really just two lines of text, usually one at the top, one at the bottom, with a single image, yet they can evoke multiple contexts all mashed together in perfect symmetry to create intricate concepts with layers of meaning and humor. And some of these are so funny, they make my stomach hurt. Some memes will make me laugh for days. And it's just done with what's essentially a postage stamp worth of information. Who would have thought 20 years ago something like that was possible? Because all we had in comparison were political memes. And political memes, let's be honest, are boring. Well, that's sort of the problem with memes. Or the, well, not a problem for us. It's the beautiful thing about memes for us is that they're so complex that they're not accessible to everyone. 
it's become a secret language. Now, obviously, some memes are simple and dumb enough that anyone can get. If you go, <laughs> I, I know what you guys are thinking. There are, are places on Facebook you can go and find cursed memes made by people who simply either don't understand the art form or just have the worst sense of humor ever. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about viral or popular memes that get shared across the more mainstream sites like Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit. And the way that a meme, each individual meme, can evolve is a linear. Different concepts can be added and subtracted, and the entire context of the meme could even be changed. Sometimes that's even the joke, is just that it's an anti-version of the meme. For example, there's a very popular meme right now of two people looking out of either side of a bus. A depressed man looking at a rock wall, and a happy man taking photos of scenery who's sitting on the opposite side of the bus, which is overlooking mountains. And there's lots of different jokes. The guy on the left is looking at anime, and that's why he's sad. And guy on the right is looking at football. It's like, yeah, Americans, that's a bad example. I probably should have thought of an example. <laughs> but that's basically how it works, is you make fun of the guy on the left by saying he's watching something terrible to sort of incense somebody else, and then the guy on the right is watching the thing that you like, more or less. But just recently, somebody released a version of this where the windows are mostly covered all the way down to almost the bottom with a dark pink ring, and the words just say, Kirby to imply Kirby is eating the bus and I laughed at that for an hour straight Because it totally breaks the meme. That's not even the point of the meme And I've got to let you in on a little secret here And I sort of led into that by saying that it's there's a problem with memes And that secret is that our dystopian corporate overlords hate memes Let me explain now, often you'll hear the media complain about political extremists using specific memes or specific characters in memes to try to paint all people who use those memes or use those images as being immoral in some way. Pepe the Frog was a really good example of this. At the time, it seemed silly, like why would they try to take away this fucking frog animation? But the thing is that it became demonized to the point where I feel dirty using it now because now there is a public perception that extremists use the frog. And I don't immediately think that when I see it. I mean, lots of my friends still use it. I don't judge those that use it. But they, they ruined it for me, I guess is more the point. And that's not the only time they've done that. But they will complain in general about memes and memeing. Political extremists will tend to use specific types of memes. Political memes in general, I, I tend to steer away from. I'm not really into the politics game anymore at all. I feel like I've said my piece. Though they are right, there is like a certain, a certain tone to political extremist memes that is a little bit off-putting. What they complain about the most what bothers them the most about these extremist memes is that sometimes they look like normal memes and if you share them on Facebook to any old little lady or your younger brother or whatever, they might just see on the surface level a normal joke. But memes, because it is a postage stamp of information with multiple contexts, sometimes some of those contexts are very subtle that subconsciously you would pick up on it, but consciously you wouldn't be thinking about what the implications of something would be in a meme, and extremist ideas can get slipped in. Yes, that sucks. But in that same way, that's, that's just how memes work, though. Good messages are also subconsciously hidden in, or not even hidden, I don't like use the word hidden, it's more just that they're so subtle that you don't consciously think about them while you're reading the meme. And the thing is, too, with memes, you're just on to the next meme or on to the next image, and you're just not thinking about it anymore. You know, you get your chuckle, and you move on, and you absorb it subconsciously. It can also just be used, obviously, for people that are in the know, dog whistles, 
That's the word that they use in the media a lot. Yes, dog whistles. But the thing is that people usually pick up on those and eventually they get called out. Though that's not helping extremism. I am not convinced that it's not as big a problem for pipelining extremism as the media likes to portray. The reason the media is so fussy about that is because it's a tool that we can use to subvert them. I was talking with her about French humor, and she was telling me about how it's very sarcastic, and it just sounded very subvertive the way that she described it. And I could sort of imagine how that could develop in a highly aristocratical society where, yeah, Marie Antoinette goes by and you say very sarcastically, oh, there goes Marie Antoinette. I love Marie Antoinette. And she would go by thinking like, oh, thank you. That's what a boost to my ego. But everyone else in the crowd would know that he's being sarcastic, that the inside joke is that they all fucking hate her. It's still like that today. The powers that be simply do not understand humor. They don't understand subtlety. Things go over their head all the time. I've worked in government. I've worked in all sorts of different industries where these sorts of people end up in positions of power. And they just understand the world differently than we do. The kinds of people that end up in those positions are much, much more literal in the way that they think and the way that they talk. And I'm sure, you know, the embarrassment of sharing a meme and not realizing that it's totally shitting on them, only to find out later on that they were basically uh, slapping themselves on the ass by retweeting something. Like, that's one thing. But it's another that we can totally diminish and undermine different corporations, the government, whatnot, through these memes, through subversive means. Subversive memes. They hate that. I'm not going to die for Pepe. Pepe doesn't matter that much to me. Though, I would like to bring him up in a video. There is a conspiracy theory about him that's uh, actually very interesting. Very fun. And of course, ties back to Egypt. Everything I do ties back to Egypt. That's not my fault. That's not my fault, guys. But memes are just too complex. They're too varied. They evolve too quickly. The art form of memeing is always changing, too. New ideas are always introduced. New forms of comedy are born of it. And it's a-linear, non-linear. It's unintuitive. But intelligence communities, like, uh, you know, the kinds of boys that glow green, they use memes as well as part of psychological warfare. A significant percentage of political memes that we see in the mainstream, the ones that get shared, usually most of them have been, if not created by, then they were filtered through some intelligence agency. You know, or at least the likelihood that that's happened has increased quite a good deal. The more popular a, a, a mainstream meme is. And not only that, but they'll even, intelligence services will even generate fake responses, whether with people or with bots and all of that is to sort of sway discourse one way or another sort of convince people to think one way or another about an idea sure but in subtle ways they sort of steer the conversation as well because you know it's one thing to introduce an idea but the days of television are over where they can just put up subtle propaganda and then change to the next program no, we comment under stuff now. So they have to comment under it too. Because if it's just us, we can talk about whatever the hell we want. We can come up with whatever ideas we want about something. But if they absolutely swarm a comment section or a reply section with their Overton window, with the specific talking points that they want us to discuss... It doesn't matter what we say within that realm of thought. They've won simply by keeping us in that corral. My favorite thing to do is to break the narrative created by the mainstream. It's one of those things that I'm very proud of. It was kind of my curse, though, because I was sort of naive about my ability to do that. Sort of like Chappie. 
You know, a bunch of people convinced me that I was doing good by just drilling the media and ideological groups and all that, and I wasn't doing as much good as I thought I was. You know, there's there's a dirty side of this. But the answer is not to remove characters from canon. It's not to remove Pepe from our arsenal of characters that we can use. It's one of the stupidest things. But this is a tool that we have to fight them as well. It's a thought form that is just for us. And imagine that on the scale of Mickey Mouse. This is exactly the time in history that we need something like that. Anyways, it was revealed quite a few years ago that intelligence communities do this. I want to list them, but I also don't want to get suicided. But you can look this up. It was released, this information, but the media cycle on it was like half a second, and then they moved on to the next thing. Just like Snowden, of course. Big surprise. But imagine a foreign power wanted to cripple our economy. Well, what if they created a fake movement? An intelligence community started telling truckers that they should all get together and clog up the roads so that all cargo hauling is completely stopped. And that would just completely cripple the economy, wouldn't it? I'm not saying that that's what happened. I'm just using that as an example because the convoy has just been on my mind a bit lately. But there was like, there was a lot of fuckery around the Capitol riot in Washington, D.C. And I'm not saying that the people who were involved in actually rioting are in no way responsible. They are 100% guilty of everything they did. They should not have done what they did. But the question comes up, how organic was that movement? Who was pulling the strings? How were they getting funding for this? I mean, I think I know the answers to those things, but again, I want to avoid that heart attack gun. <laughs> but yes, big tech. Big dystopian tech. We talked about the metaverse last time, the VR world and hints of the dystopian future when uh, Walmart, the Walmart assistant comes up and says, you already have milk in your refrigerator, a full gallon of it. Take that out of your cart, put it back. That's disgusting. Not that we're being harassed by the assistant. Like, we're sold like it's a convenience. Like, oh, isn't that nice? She's looking out for you. She's just telling you that you already have this item and she's saving you from spending extra money that you don't need to spend on this milk. But the question comes up, why does Walmart know that I already have milk? And how do they know how much of it I have? How is that any of their fucking business? And the truth is that they already know these things. Especially if you're making your purchases with credit cards. They know these things. There are complex layers of different bots and algorithms and whatnot tracking all your purchases and things you search and things you save. And of course, I was railing against Elon Musk's brain chip. And I think the man is evil. That's my opinion. Oh, I saved a couple uh, headlines that came out recently. Very, very depressing. But he's been in the media f several times. Quotes from his ex-wife, quotes from ex co-workers and partners and whatnot there are a lot of really bad stories during the pandemic he was getting in quite a good deal of trouble for essentially forcing tesla employees to return to the factory and continue manufacturing even though the entire country was on lockdown or at least his state was they weren't legally supposed to do that yet he was essentially firing anybody that refused to come into work He's been busted for union busting. He has no love for his employees. Elon Musk literally just announced that he's leaving Tesla. He's been over the coals for a while for all these sorts of shenanigans going on at Tesla. But he's stuck it through, plus 
all of this pressure from investors that are always pissed that they're not making enough money because the cars are terrible, people are not buying them fast enough, and even the people that are buying them are not getting them fast enough, and then when they're getting them, their build quality is terrible. Sorry, that's all unrelated. I just, I just don't like Elon Musk. Anyways, he finally decides to leave. And then that same day, I find this article from Al Jazeera saying California is suing Elon Musk's Tesla, alleging that it runs a racially segregated workplace and discriminates against black employees. Black workers report being concentrated in parts of its factory. One called it the plantation. Also, some of these black employees are hearing racial slurs upwards of a hundred times per day. Now, this could all be exaggerated. These are just allegations. But, I don't know, the timing just seems a little off, right? But the worst one, being an animal lover. Another article on the New York Post. Elon Musk's brain chip company, Neuralink, is facing legal challenges from an animal rights group that has accused the company of subjecting monkeys to extreme suffering during years of gruesome experiments. So, uh, yeah. Supposedly, like, when was, when was it I said this? Like, two or three weeks ago? They're... They're lobbying for human trials. Meanwhile, it turns out... Oh, you're going to hate this. 15 out of 23 monkeys implanted with Elon Musk's Neuralink brain chip have reportedly died. 15 of 23. What the fuck is going on? But it's hard to tell who t treats their employees worse, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. I think Bezos, you could give him the award for that because he just has so many employees. So the potential for mistreatment is just exponentially higher in an Amazon uh, fulfillment center. Plus, I, I could rant all night about their space race, SpaceX versus whatever that penis rockets Amazon was building. The whole uh, space race thing is just... It's a sign of the end. <laughs> it's a sign of the end. Because all we hear in the media all the time is how we're running out of resources, running out of fuel. The environment is slowly cooking us to death. Plus, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The have-nots are earning less, losing their homes, losing their jobs, losing their livelihoods. And the haves are earning more. Both Bezos and Elon Musk reported record net worths in the last year or two, in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Absolutely ludicrous that two men can own so much wealth between the two of them. Just doesn't make sense. It's clearly a giant transfer of wealth, precursor to oh so many bad things to come. This episode is not about that, so I'm not going to go down that road. But those of us who don't have much or don't have anything are sitting here suffering through this pandemic, barely making it work. But all the millionaires get to take rocket rides, guys. We get to watch them in the news take a rocket ride. They get to see Earth from high up in the space. Isn't it fun, guys, that we're so far along technologically that we still have nothing, that we have less than we had? But the haves, the people that have things, have more? Isn't that amazing that we live in the fucking future now? We get to watch William Shatner go up in a rocket. What a culturally significant moment. People are getting fucking kicked out on the street for not making rent. Landlords are taking this time to gentrify their neighborhoods. It is funny that they look like penises, though. <laughs> and just Jeff Bezos came off as just so detached, so tone deaf. He was full on Marie Antoinette when they interviewed him after his rocket ride. I, I don't think that that's hyperbole. 
the lack of self-awareness that he shows. He thinks he's a hero. He, he put on a fucking cowboy hat. He thinks it made him look cool. He has no idea everyone fucking hates him. He has no idea. How is that possible? How many billions of dollars would I need to have for me to not know what people think of me? I can't even imagine a number that high. How does he not care? He's literally famous for mistreating his employees. So back to the metaverse. <laughs> The metaverse is very clearly the first step to the matrix. And this early on in its infancy, it seems silly to worry about the matrix. It is premature, but at least from a historical standpoint, from an observational standpoint, we can say that it's interesting to watch this happen. People choosing to live online with VR goggles strapped to their face to create a character that they think better represents themselves and experience parts of the world artificially. And, the, you know, the timing of this coming out, the timing of this becoming popular when the lockdowns become more of a thing. Isolation becomes very popular. It's not a huge surprise that suddenly there, there's a big push to bring technology like this to the forefront. They're not quite ready to launch it yet. Uh, I don't even want to talk. I, I would suggest maybe don't look it up. But, there, you know, there's just like a very despicable act that happened in a, an early VR group. Shows that people are just not ready for this thing yet. But it's a subtle, simple way to sort of suck your brain into the online world. I get to be that old man now. I'm, I'll be 40 in a, in a couple of years. In two or three years. So I get to be the old man here and say that I'm just, I'm not going to get into that. And I, <laughs> I don't know really anybody that is even remotely interested in getting involved in that. There's more to it than just the metaverse. Cryptocurrency is scary shit. Bitcoin is scary shit. The way that some of these sort of just popped up this blockchain shit that it's the complaint that most people make especially with the american dollar is that it has no real value it's a fiat currency and that though it used to be backed by gold which gave it some value something to balance its value off of it no longer is based off of gold so the solution to that the solution to a a currency that is accepted globally, that is backed on, let's be honest, it's backed on oil, but it's also globally recognized. We're going we're gonna to stop trusting that, and we're going to start using this blockchain money that has no backing at all, and the creator is 100% anonymous. And we're just supposed to trust that it's not some fucking intelligence agency in some foreign nation that has started this. And that they're not just using it to secretly, subtly fund different groups, manipulating governments around the world. Still trying to avoid that heart attack gun. And of course, new cryptocurrencies are fucking announced every week almost now. There's so many of them. And the thing is, there are success stories. Like, obviously, a lot of the early adopters got rich off of it. A lot of people did. I know that you guys are making arguments for Bitcoin in the chat there. Feel free to leave a comment. I would love to hear arguments for why Bitcoin is the future. Obviously, a lot of you are going to have bought in to cryptocurrency. I know people that have made money off of it. And I know people that are invested in it. But one thing that I'm just going to straight up recommend that you just stay the fuck away from is NFTs. NFTs are a really weird gateway to the matrix. Is that what, is that what I'm going to call them? Gateways? It's like an early baby step to the matrix. And I know that sounds crazy, but the logic of the NFT is rather evil as well. It's super corrupt, super manipulative, super deceptive. 
most of them are basically set up as like a Ponzi scheme. Their value requires that new people constantly buy in. And like brand new NFTs of the ugliest goddamn monkeys I've ever seen in my entire life sell for more than the value of a home during a time when homes have never been worth more. People that should be buying land are buying monkey pictures. And the idea is that when you buy this image, it's just a JPEG that exists on the internet, no less. Like, it literally is a JPEG on the internet. People are supposed to just trust that that image is just yours and only yours and only you have access to it. Yet, it's famous that people just screenshot or right-click save image these JPEGs constantly. Almost every single one of these NFTs has copies. There's an idea that this whole thing is going to be policed so that if you have a picture that's an NFT, that it can be copyright claimed. But ye good luck keeping that consistent. What's scary, though, is that there are several big-name Hollywood celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow that are pushing this NFT thing. It's terrifying. Also, there is an internal logic to some of these NFTs. Some of them, they belong in these universes. And if you own a certain type of an NFT, it makes you a certain type of member of that community. Say there's a galaxy and you can buy a planet that exists in that galaxy and you can sort of give it its own name if you want. And there's like a, a story to the galaxy or to that planet. Okay, I'm, get, I'm just getting depressed talking about this. The idea of NFTs just makes me depressed. Not just the idea of people wasting their money on JPEGs, on pixels, on a computer screen. But the fact that they're getting so invested in this emotionally, mentally, applying my empathy to that, it just, I'm imagining myself in that position and it just makes me sad. Like, how, how sad would I have to be to be that emotionally and mentally invested in a pixelated world? I mean, it's what makes that a gateway to the Matrix is that emotional investment in it. The idea that this online world holds value. It's like Second Life or World of Warcraft, but worse because there's no actual framework for this community outside of this blockchain. And the people, the way people argue about them and they get so upset about them, like it's, it's become a cult, like the bad kind of cult. But NFTs are the anti-meme. They're like the final boss for memes. They're the antithesis of memeing. See, the thing that makes the internet so beautiful is that it's the Wild West. It's the tail end of it. Electricity has just come. Police forces are starting to roll into every town. The federal government is trying to shore up all the states. We got the rail line going through the entire country. We got we gotta be we gotta be united now. Well, there's still some of us out here memeing, right? And well, not that that's ever gonna die. But what makes memes so beautiful is that they're free. Anyone can download them, alter them however they want, share them however they want. Sure, there are a handful of meme lords who watermark their memes, like Dolan Dark. But outside of those few, kind of, some of them are kind of dingy for doing it. Most people are really awesome about it. And even I have seen memes or even meme concepts that I know I invented show up on other sources. Hell, I think even a Star Wars account memed me pointing Han Solo's gun to my head once. That's a free art form. It's something we share. It's something that we evolve together, that we create together, that we enjoy together. Things either are funny or they disappear. They're evocative or they're forgettable. NFTs 
take that concept and turn them entirely upside down so that a select few can make lots and lots and lots of money off of people that have been sold on the cryptocurrency idea but manipulated into thinking that this JPEG concept is even remotely similar. Again, just like with cryptocurrency, you're going to find examples of people who have success stories. Obviously, especially the earlier adopters are going to have success stories. But the economy of NFTs has already gotten out of fucking control. You can pretty much guarantee goddamn tea that you're not going to make a penny off of your monkey i'm team meme as it were i want more freedom i want more community and youtube used to have that youtube used to actually be a social media platform when i started off i was doing reply videos and that was fairly innocent at the time. In the atheist community, that's how we communicated with each other. It was a debate platform. You could literally reply to a video with a video. And if the original creator liked your reply, they could put your reply under their video. And we did that with each other all the time. Also, Google+, Plus, G+, Plus, which was Google's answer to Facebook... It no longer exists, but at the time that I got popular at first, it was because the atheist community was sharing stuff on Google+. That and many other ways to sort of share and interact with each other on the platform. It was very conducive for discussion, for debate, and that's what I felt like I was doing. I was a fairly small channel at the time. I was dealing with channels that were bigger than me at the time. And I would respond mostly to creationists and just debunk their assertions about creationism and tell them the science, what we know about the truth of evolution and whatnot. You know, fast forward a bit of time, I actually end up becoming somehow a somewhat sizable YouTuber. Now I look back at all those old videos and they have way too many views, way more than the original video that the original content creator head because they are now a small channel next to me and now I have this entire library of videos like that and now there's an entirely new genre of creators that do the same thing they have a silly head on a suit and they respond to socio-political content and they're doing it very 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 frequently and it's starting to make corporations nervous MTV comes to me and they more or less beg me and offer me money to go on one of their web shows or something and, I don't know, try to convince all these creators that do essentially the same kind of content that I do to stop being so mean. Apparently, all these corporate people, they see this genre and they look at me and they think I'm the leader of this group, or at least the creator of the genre. And I, I guess more or less I was the creator of the genre, the silly animations re responding to sillier videos. And now it's considered harassment to reply in that way. Now you can get away with it once, maybe twice, but a lot of channels that make content like that started disappearing. Their videos would get deleted or their channels would just straight up get banned. I survived luckily. And around that time, I started rebranding as well at the beginning of the pandemic. So it was a good time to sort of get rid of some of those videos I no longer resonated with. But also some of these videos that were disproportionate, the ones where the creators I responded to were definitely way too small to have the armored skeptic plastering their face on his channel with almost, if not over, a million views. And I guess that was the part that was the biggest jagged rock to swallow was that a lot of the videos that fit that description had over a million views. I lost tens of millions of views when I made that brand change. Anyways, technology is not going to save us. The future is a lie. We're running out of resources. The planet is slowly becoming uninhabitable. The major powers around the world are shoring up their resources, taking over territories, 
pointing their drones and their guns at each other over borders and shipping lanes, China, Russia, Iran, always showing up in the news, causing trouble. Jeff Bezos' private rocket rides are not going to make the world any better. They're not going to fix any of these problems. It's just a distraction. It's just theater. Half the shit Elon Musk says in the media promoting future ideas is just it's just theater. Like, Elon Musk literally shot a car into space for fun. It's a fucking joke. And I was complaining about the Mars colony thing, the, the fact that Musk wants to die on Mars. I don't know if I can properly articulate how frustrated I am about this or why, but the Mars colony concept is obviously not going to be the answer either. We're way too far away from making that work. We can't even reliably create long-range rockets yet. We don't know even for sure if we can get a human to survive the trip. Because after they cross through the Van Allen belt, they'll essentially be open to a bombardment of cosmic radiation. They'll be in there. Musk wanting to die on Mars is like an ego thing. It's not heroic, it's selfish. To stand behind that idea is to stand behind a suicide mission. I've recommended Thunderfoot before. He uh, is a contemporary of mine. Love his channel. So many of his most recent videos have been about Elon Musk. Really, he would do a much better job of listing all of the things that Musk has done that are annoying or lies than I could possibly do. But I got a few examples that really bothered me. So he owns a company called The Boring Company. Literally, they bore tunnels. And they've infamously, famously, bored several tunnels in LA, California, and they're doing some in Nevada. They are actually doing a, a series of tunnels under Las Vegas. And the idea is to transport people under the roads to alleviate traffic. The selling of this idea was really good. Elon Musk showed graphics of a series of tunnels that interconnected with each other, that had rails that a car could sit on a platform, and it would fly down these rails, and you could get across town one end to the other nonstop without having to go through traffic. All you had to do was put your car on a little elevator and it put it under the road and it flew through town. And the tunnels looked so big and intricate. There were so many cars and it was just, you use your car. The idea sounded so cool. But then you look at the final product and he has the tiniest, jankiest little tunnels. There's no way to get your car down there. They, you have to use the cars that are already down there. They come with their own driver. And they're, not e they're Teslas. And the idea was that they're supposed to be self-driving. This was supposed to be an extension of Tesla. They were going to create a Tesla-only underground tunnel system of cars and rails for cars. And the final product is now there are a bunch of Tesla SUVs that are essentially glorified taxis that use these underground tunnels. And it's not a maze. They're not interconnected. It's literally just point A to point B. From one casino to another, it's a glorified shuttle service. The worst part, of course, is that it requires several employees. People to literally drive the cars because the self-driving cars can't self-drive down the boring tunnels. Oh, what a major mistake to make. You think you want to be sure that your self-driving cars know how to drive down a tunnel before you promise that self-driving cars are going to drive down a tunnel. Whatever, one, one little mistake. But I know a good deal about underground tunnel boring uh, because I watched Die Hard 3. In that movie, they show what a tunnel boring machine looks like. And the one in that film is relatively medium sized. But the ones that they have today that bore straight through mountains to create multi-level freeways are colossal. I showed a graphic of one 
in one of my UFO videos. I think it was in the Phil Schneider video, Dulce Base. But Elon Musk's tunnels, the ones that the boring company drills, they're very small. They're literally just big enough for a single car to pass through. Meanwhile, there are multiple eight-lane highways in some of these tunnels. So Elon Musk's boring company, I don't know how he acquired the company or the drills, but it seems like he got some wicked deal on them and didn't know what he was buying. He just bought some drills and wanted to drill holes under LA. I, th I think that's as far as he thought. But the size of the hole, the size of the tunnel is just big enough for a single vehicle. What that means is that those boring machines are designed to create tunnels for service equipment, such as pipes, wires, tubes, and they are big enough for a car to drive down so that a car can service said pipes or tubes or wires. Tunnels that big are not designed to be used as roadways. Like a sewer has what they call a manhole and ladders and maybe sidewalking areas for people so that service engineers can go down there and access things. But you wouldn't say that a sewer is designed for people. I love that I've just compared Elon Musk's underground tunnels to sewers. I feel good about that. Anyways, the final product of these tunnels is nothing like what he promised. And that's always the theme with Elon Musk, is he promises way, way more than he delivers. And he almost always sells his ideas as brand new ideas when none of them have been. Electric cars have existed since the 1800s. He did not invent them. They were one of the first kind of car, the Hyperloop. I mentioned the Hyperloop last time too, but honestly, that's a joke as well. It's never going to work. I don't know how it, the idea has gotten this far. The only answer for it is that it's just blatant, obvious technology future theater. Again, another distraction, trying to make us think that the future is coming, that we have something to look forward to. There are so many problems with the Hyperloop. And again, it's not a, it's not a new idea. It's literally a pneumatic tube that you put a cylinder in with people. All they've done is change it from pneumatic to vacuum tube. I think this too was an, a late 1800s, early 1900s concept that's been brought back to life. What's wrong with it is what they want to do is create a vacuum tube that reaches from the bottom of California to the top of California. So in something like 45 minutes, you can travel what would normally take four to six hours to travel. Sounds awesome. I don't know why you wouldn't just get a high-speed rail, but fine. Well, they want it to go through the valley because the valley is basically flat and open already, ready to go. The problem is that how do you create a tube that literally goes hundreds of kilometers that can stay perfectly sealed, connected, and aligned, regardless of temperature changes, weather changes, environment changes, wear and tear from regular use. If at any point along that hundreds of miles of long tube, there is a rupture, it could kill any and all of the vehicles that are inside of the tube simultaneously. When the tube gets really, really hot in LA, but gets kind of cool somewhere up near San Francisco, that's going to change the shape of the tube so much that it's almost guaranteed to create a crack. So maybe you want a, a shorter tube, one that only goes 50 to 100 kilometers. Then you run into another problem is that the thing can't have turns, basically very, very subtle turns, because the idea is that they're supposed to go very fast. That brings us to our second problem. So most of these test facilities are way out in the desert where there's lots of wide open space, lots of open land. They don't really have any that are more than just a 
a couple kilometers long, which is not great. Means that they've yet to actually get one of these pods up to speed. We don't even know if that's going to work yet. It's a huge problem. Like we we know that the concept works, but we don't know we're actually going to get the speed we need yet because we have yet to create a track that's long enough. So Richard Branson, I think that's his name, the head of Virgin, also is in the Hyperloop game, competing with Elon Musk, I guess. And he wants to also create Hyperloops in the United States. He asked a bunch of different states in the United States to lobby him to have their test facilities built in their state. And not just test facilities, but first properly running tracks. Like the idea is to create working tracks. Well, for some reason, they chose Virginia, which is quite mountainous. It's going to be next to impossible to create a straight track in Virginia unless they're planning on drilling hundreds of miles through mountains, basically. Or this thing's going to be so high up in the air that it's basically going to be like a... <laughs> it's going to be like an amusement ride. The whole concept behind the Hyperloop just doesn't make sense. Yet it just keeps getting pushed forward. The last saving grace of the future is supposed to be automation. Every time a new robot is introduced, a new AI, a new automated product of some sort, it's sold to us as the future getting easier for all of us. But that's not what we see with automation. It almost always leads to somebody losing a job. Automation has led to less jobs, less earnings, more poverty. And there's also the philosophical argument that you make life too easy and you sort of miss the point of life. There are certain daily rituals that are healthy, like cooking yourself food every day. Yeah, it can get frustrating and annoying to have to spend the time and it takes longer to cook than it does to eat and even longer to clean. But that ritual is good for you. I am pretty tired of this future lie. I'm getting tired of front men like Elon Musk being shoved in our face as saviors of humanity, leaders for the future, when they're just not. Elon Musk was born rich. His dad earned their family fortune in South Africa during the time of apartheid. Sure, that doesn't make Musk evil, but makes me wonder on what level has his ego justified that. He's famous for founding PayPal. But the other members of PayPal said that his role was not that substantial and that he actually left the company before it was even called PayPal. His ex-wife said that he basically acted like a megalomaniacal tyrant. And once she said, I'm not one of your employees. You can't treat me like this. And he responded, if you were one of my employees, I would have fired you a long time ago. And he's the best we've got. The future is a lie. Uh, we're going to listen to a little bit more Samtar. I'm going to take a quick break. And then we're going to be back with viewer stories. I've got four or five really good stories. A couple audio clips you guys have definitely not heard before. I'll be back here in five minutes. In the shadows, aren't you friends? And the ghosts... They'll pretend And we'll wonder Why We don't speak Alright, I am back Thank you for your patience Thank you for your patronage Thank you for your loyalty <laughs> Beautiful people at home This is what, my 25th? 24th? 25th episode now? It's nice that I've been able to keep this going this long. You know, I, I'm one of those people that works way too hard. And it's by choice. I give myself a project and I just refuse to do the bare minimum amount of work on it. I always give myself extra work. I always spend too much time editing, making sure I'm getting the perfect shot, the perfect lighting, the perfect audio. And this show basically forces me to do the bare minimum amount of work. Which, for me, is still way more work than most people do. I'm such an idiot. But I really enjoy... 
our Saturday night mass. You guys bring me so much joy. I know that today's episode was really depressing. That's probably why you guys keep asking me what's wrong. But uh, no, I've been in a really good mood. I think I chose a depressing subject for tonight's episode because I feel like emotionally I could handle it. Except for maybe the monkeys. I'm definitely crying about the monkeys. God damn it. But uh, I don't know if that's going to be the next episode. Probably not. I have another script I was working on uh, about secret societies. You know, like the Rosicrucians, the Priory of Scion, which probably wasn't real. The Templars. And then all of what they were doing in the Americas before the 1700s. Also, Washington. A lot of people don't know George Washington was a Freemason. And a lot of American art alludes to that. And some sort of veneration of him that goes beyond just him being the first president and a war hero. The Washington Monument, for example, is literally an obelisk. That's a hint. All right, we got a couple of super chats here. If you guys want your voices heard, there's two ways to do it. You can send me a super chat during the live stream. I live stream these on Saturday nights, usually at 10 p.m. Eastern time. And you can also email me your stories to fullmetaltuxedo at gmail.com. Make sure to use that email address for your stories. And you're going to get the gist of it when you listen to the stories I'm going to play for you tonight and read for you tonight. You can either type me out a story or record yourself telling a story of something strange, unexplained, bizarre, supernatural that's happened to you or to happen to somebody that you know. You can even interview somebody that you know. Uh, we played an interview the last episode that was very cute. The first one we have here from Johnny D. Smithson. He says, I can't believe I caught the stream. What's up with the trucker Canadian thing? Thanks for the full model tuxedo. I'm a U.S. medic, and this podcast gets me through the day. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for the super chat, Johnny. I really appreciate the kind words. Canadian truckers have taken action against the Canadian government. The idea is that they're fed up with all the restrictions from the lockdowns and whatnot. And this is how they are trying to enact action to change that. I can't tell you how that's going to work. I don't want to say what my opinion is exactly. But I'm seeing very, very positive, beautiful things coming from this group. And also really fucking terrible things, too. Both are happening. So I don't want to say that the convoy is a good thing or a bad thing. It is just a thing we're dealing with right now. That's how I'll put it. So thank you, Johnny. <laughs> uh, Barrett Privateer, thank you for the super chat, says... You like minion memes, Greg? No, actually, um, I should have mentioned bad memes, like terrible memes. Like, with any sense of humor, if something is unfunny, it is painful. So, minion memes absolutely fall in that category. There's no way to make a self-aware minion meme. If you have the minion in there, the minion is in there. Thank you for the super chat, Barrett. Uh, the Ellis, wow, says, love you, bro. Thank you so much for the super chat. Very generous, the Ellis. Catra Deviant, all oh, just as generous. Thank you, Cat. You're so good to me. Because Kitty Meow, you better give her a kiss later. Oh, yes, Stash, you mean. I will make sure to give the cat a kiss later. Thank you for the super chat. James Jones, thank you for the super chat. Wow, so nice. Wise you are. Thank you, James. You're not only generous, but you are kind. God damn. You guys are way too good to me. The Ellis, thank you for the super chat. Let the hate flow smile. <laughs> I must have been ranting about Jeff Bezos or uh, Elon Musk at some point. And the Ellis again, wow, thank you for the super chat, says, Gregory, I have heard that there is 
a even more secret base outside of Area 51, like they made a whole new place somewhere else in Nevada. Okay, this is what I love about this show, is how you guys just totally fucking change the subject on me, and you make me go from talking about whatever the hell I made the episode about, Sasquatch, and then you just force me to completely change gears in my head and talk about something that I hadn't even thought about in months. And I can just readily pull an opinion out. And that's so fun for me. This is the part of our relationship that is beautiful and beneficial for me. This is what I get out of it. The way you stimulate my brain. When you ask me random fucking questions like this, it's like a drug for my brain. Anyways, all I was gonna say with that though, the fact that we know about Area 51 means that it is not a secret base. And the idea that I got from the Dulce base video and the Dumbs Deep Underground Military base video that I did is that we know about maybe two to 400 American underground bases or whatever. That probably means there were many, many more. And if they're telling us about a few secret bases, then yeah, you can imagine that there's probably an exponential amount, even more, that are completely off the books. There's a secret American listening base in Australia, and it was completely off the record until the 90s or something like that, but it was around for much longer than that, since maybe the se uh, 70s or 80s. The Chronic. Thank you for the super chat, Chronic. He says, I heard this one guy went across the country using only a tank of water, and he ended up with a bullet in his head. Glad you are back to streaming, by the way. Yeah. Well, it's kind of fun and funny to be one of those people that that's like hey if if you guys if I turn up dead I didn't kill myself it's like I'm not really big enough to worry about that but there is a part of my brain that's like am I gonna be one of these guys that has a bullet in the back of my head because Wendigoon he's a much more mainstream youtuber that does essentially the same thing that I do he recently did a video on Martin Luther King's assassination, essentially proving that the FBI killed him. And he several times in the video jokes that he's being ironic, that he's telling a joke that this happened in Minecraft. But the thing is that that risk exists, though. I know the people who usually get killed are the ones that are involved, though, not random assholes with a YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm gonna start off with one that I can read here. Hey Greg, I'm Chris. Your show is great fun. I really enjoy your content. Thank you, Chris. That's very kind of you. So I got a simple little UFO story for you. Nothing too crazy, but it certainly left me feeling perplexed. I hope you enjoy. I was at work during a night shift up north in Manitoba at a hydroelectric converter station. I had finished my rounds, and me and the shift operator now simply had to stay awake and respond to any alarms that might come up. Oh no. A, a job of boredom is one of the most dangerous jobs, especially when there's a risk element. I was having a smoke on the platform out back behind the control room when I noticed a light. It was just a red light at first, and I almost mistaken it for a big hydro transmission tower, but I quickly realized the power lines ran down the other side of the station. So I went back inside to grab the binoculars and watched it for a bit and discovered that it was slowly phase through different colors, red, yellow, blue, white, and orange, which almost had me thinking aircraft, but the pattern was irregular. You didn't know what color it would turn into next. Random order. Wow, so I've actually never heard that before. I've heard of color changing UFOs, 
But nobody ever said the detail that there was no pattern to the color change. That's not something anybody has would have noticed, I don't know. I guess if you were thinking it was an aircraft, you'd expect to see a pattern, and when you noticed there was not one, it would fuck with your head. That's actually a detail I guess was left out from the Randlesham Forest incident. And the pulses were too slow. So at this point, I grab the operator and show him too, thinking, maybe I'm seeing things. The light was observed by the two of us and continued to pulse random colors of light for about 20 to 30 minutes. I should note the light was also stationary this entire time until it blinked out twice. Okay. It like it compl went completely dark twice. That's interesting. Then after blinking out a third time, it reappeared in a different part of the sky. Wow, so only that one time. That would really fuck with my head. Left and above the original position, then faded out and disappeared forever. I would have thought I was seeing some sort of event take place on a distant star. But it moved just that once. Wow. Wow, that's a really, really good point. Yeah, if it didn't move ever, I could have just said, maybe you saw a supernova dude. But you're right, it moved one time. Just once. So you knew it wasn't happening far away. That seems intelligent, right? It seemed to know you were watching it, and it gave you that one irregularity that you couldn't explain. It's not a pattern, but it moves one time? Something might be controlling that. So he finishes by saying, To this day, I have no real clue as to what it can be, and I'm reluctant to speculate further than to say we could not identify it. Wow, thank you so much, Chris. That was an incredible story. Really glad I put it in this episode. That's a really good story. Very simple, very short. I mean, sometimes when I see stories that are this short, I worry about putting them on the show because I don't want to have to read 20 stories in one episode, but also sometimes these stories are the best ones. All right, the next story is from Jason. Jason was nice enough to send me two audio files. I kind of want to play the preface, but he did say that it was a message just for me. I mean, he does stroke my ego, so I guess maybe it's best I don't play it. But it's just like great sort of comments about this genre. So I know you like world building and details, so I'm gonna do a little bit of that right now for you. So this happens in Western New York, pretty similar to Canada actually. Uh, basically a version of Canada that's slightly less cold and has a lot more abandoned factories. Uh, that would describe Western New York pretty well. I was there at my grandparents' house. I've got about 100 acres of land, uh, an ATV up there. This was in August, I think. I was 16 at the time. And this was, so this was like four years ago. No, 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 it would have been closer to like, it's 2022, right? This would have been in 2018, roughly. So yeah, um, I think that's pretty close. Ah, it's close enough, right? Either way, um, I, I had brought my dogs down there, right? To let them run around and have some fun while they were in a place where they could, you know, run around and enjoy themselves. Uh, either way, two things about the dogs you need to know right off the bat. Both of them love water, water fanatic. I mean, they might as well just be fish at this point. They love running around in the water. I'll turn on the hose, right? And they'll start eating the water. Like as it's coming out of the hose, they'll jump up and try and like eat it. It's just, oh, it's hilarious. They both have severe anxiety as well. Um, one of them actually has anxiety to the point where like she has to be near you all the time or, um, or she'll freak out. It's, it's, yeah, it's wild. Either way, um, at the time, uh, I was not a believer in paranormal things. I was actually very much opposed to that. I was always, like, very 
scientific and whatever, like anything that's not proven. Um, you know, 16, what can I say? Um, I know, uh, that this wasn't a carbon monoxide related issue because my grandparents had a big issue with that when they lived in Indiana or Ohio. I don't remember. So they, uh, bought a ton of carbon monoxide. I think they had three in the house at the time. I think they only have two right now, but they had several, like they were going to buy more actually. They were, you know, paranoid about it. So, you know, how old people get. But, um, so, uh, anyway, they leave, um, to go to the store around 12 o'clock. Uh, the nearest one that they were going to Walmart, I think, or Aldi's one of the two. And the nearest one is about 20, 30 minutes away. So it's not abnormal for them to be gone long periods of time like that. So they leave Fox News on as old people tend to do. And... So the TV that they're watching it on, right, is in this more or less, um, this room that was added on later to the house's construction. So it's like a good foot or two below the rest of the floor level. So there's like, there's the doorway that you walk in, right? And then to the left, you have a like two foot staircase that goes up to the rest of the house, which is just all connected. And then to the right is that room and it's just... It's got two windows, one looking out to the yard, one looking out to the pond, both on the same wall. And then in the middle, there's the TV, right? So looking towards that wall, like while you're watching the TV, you can see like stuff going on on both sides there. Either way, I'm just kind of like watching it a little bit, like not really on my phone because, you know, bored teenager, what, what else am I going to do? Uh, and then I see this weird black blob thing kind of go by one of the windows and I go to see what it was because like the dogs are outside I didn't want them to get attacked by something so I go look out and I don't see anything I just get this really really bad feeling like this just sort of it wasn't bad so much as it was just like really weird like I couldn't figure out what I was feeling or why so I sort of look out the window, look at the pond, and the pond just looks different. There's something wrong about it. The rest of the house, or the rest of the uh, area, looks fine. It just feels weird. But the pond looked weird. There was something up with that pond. I couldn't figure out what it was. So I sit back down. Um, I'm like, whatever. Um, so anyway, Fox News guys are talking about some migrant caravan thing. That's important later. Uh... So then I'm I'm bored, right? And I just want to shake this feeling. So I go out and I'm, I'm playing with the dogs. And uh, one of them gets a little dirty. So I, I'm like, hey, come over here. I'm going to hose you off, right? I turn on the hose and they refuse to go near it, which is strange because they love the water. They're like obsessed with it. And I'm like, they're not even like looking at it, which is strange because normally, like, I, I don't know how to like really express how strange that is because like you can have a bottle of water and they'll go ballistic over it and the fact that i'm running water right there and they're not paying attention is just weird and all of a sudden they just take off they just start running into the woods which i shouldn't have to mention is strange because of how anxious they are so i'm like i'm sitting there bewildered at what just happened. I, I'm assuming they're just chasing some wild animal, right? So I, of course, go over, get the ATV, right? Start it up, drive around looking for them. Um, I don't find them, but instead I'm driving along and all of a sudden this eagle flies right above me, right? So I look up, I'm like, oh cool, that's an eagle. You don't see those very often, right? I mean, they're practically endangered as we, I think they are endangered, aren't they? I don't remember. But, um, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, this eight-point buck jumps. Well, I say jump, but I mean he arcs. Perfect arc. Straight over my ATV vehicle there. This, it's not like a very tall one. But he did a perfect arc from one end of the trail to the other. If I had stuck my hand out, I would have touched him. Like, it was unbelievable. I was like, holy crap, that just happened. I cannot believe that. So anyway, I'm a little weirded out at this point because I'm like, all right, this isn't like all that normal, but you know, it's explainable, right? It's not like something that's just weird, weird. 
So I go up and I look for some of the trail cameras, right? Because I assume, oh, if the dogs are up here, they would have been caught by one of the trail cameras. They would have taken pictures. So I figure I'll just take, um, I'll take the SD cards down. I'll see what's going on. Uh, see if any of them caught them. See if I can't figure out like, like sort of plot a course as to where they went, right? So I go down, I load up some of the pictures and one of them literally, like all the pictures are timestamped, right? They're timestamped to when I got, when I picked up the camera, right? Like when I grabbed it, there's not like a single picture of that. In fact, I'm not even sure that was a area that was in our woods actually. Like it didn't look like it. It didn't look like anything. It looked more like a, um, like the, uh, pi like, uh, pine trees in Oregon. It, it kind of looked like Oregon because you don't really, like, there's not a whole lot of pine trees in that area. And there was nothing but pine trees on this photo. I was like bewildered. I was just, what the hell? This is so confusing. Uh, at the time though, and I didn't realize this until I was just thinking about this just now. One of the bedroom doors was actually just kind of swinging around, going back and forth. Uh, I assumed it was a draft at the time, but thinking about it now, yeah, that is kind of uh, a little bit weird. One of the bedroom doors to my uh, grandparents' bedroom was just kind of opening and shutting. And like, cause I mean, obviously it's not like it doesn't lock in perfectly, but it it was just it was weird. Now that I think about it, I didn't really process that at the time. I just assumed it was a draft. But uh, it wasn't a windy day either. Huh. But anyway, um, I'm on my way back outside. And I see the Fox News guys. They're still talking about um, the, this migrant caravan thing. Same people that were on there earlier. And I'm, you know, a little confused about that. I check the time. Um, look at the clock. It's 2 o'clock. They left around noon. It was 2 o'clock at the time. I was like, okay. That's strange that they're still talking about the same thing. But I guess, you know they will, I guess, you know, I don't watch this enough to know how their programming works, but whatever. So I go back out to look for these dogs, right? And the ATV doesn't start, right? ATV's not starting. So I go back out to look for the dogs. Uh, ATV's not starting. I fill it up with gas. Still won't start. So I go on foot. I um, go around looking around. I do a loop around because it, it basically like all the trails kind of loop around into one area. I search the entire thing, nothing, calling them occasionally. And the only interesting thing about this was the fact that there was no noise. I didn't hear any birds, any animals, anything. Not even the rust, like it, it wasn't a windy day, but there was like a breeze occasionally. Not even the leaves rustling. It was weird. I was real thrown off by it. Anyway, at this point, I was starting to think uh, something weird, weird was going on. Like, something was, like, actually messed up. I go into the house, and one of the lights is flickering, right? And so I go get some bulbs to fix it. I'm messing around with it. Nothing fixes it, so I assume electrical problem. That's the only explanation. Um, I look at the time. Three o'clock. Okay. Not normal. Look out, pond still gives me bad vibes. I'm not sure what's going on with that. I'm worried about my grandparents now because normally they don't take three hours to go and get something at the store. So I'm like, okay, not great. Uh, so to put my mind off that, I go back to try and fix the um, camera. And suddenly I hear voices. I'm like, oh great, finally they're back. Uh, so I go out to the garage to see if they're there, if they pulled back in, nothing. Look around the entire house, nothing. At that point, I think I'm losing it, right? I think I've just lost my mind, right? I go back out into the woods, right? Because I'm at this point, I'm like really worried that something bad's going on. So I go out to look for the dogs again. Um, nothing, same thing happens. Uh, the only difference was, and I, th I think this was just in my head. Because I think, I don't think this was actually the case. I think I was just really, really, really freaked out. But I guess it's worth mentioning that my steps, every time I would step, it sounded like, it just sounded wrong, the way I was stepping. I think that was just in my head at that point. Though, who knows at this point. I go back inside after that. Clock's at 4 o'clock. Fox News is still, you know, hammering away on the same thing, same hosts. 
At that point, I'm like on the verge of a breakdown. I'm on the verge of just losing my mind. So I do the only thing I can think of, right? The only thing that I'm thinking right now is I have to figure out what's going on. I have to get to the bottom of this. And the biggest thing that's giving me these vibes, right, is the pond. So I go out to the pond to see what's wrong with it. I'm just kind of looking at the the water. I'm out there for maybe what felt like 10 minutes. It might have, I don't know if it was less than that. But uh, it sure felt like a long time that I'm just sitting there trying to figure out what was wrong. And suddenly, the way the sun was hitting it, I guess, at the time, sort of formed this little rainbow-ish arc-looking thing, like on the water. And I was like, and I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. And strangely enough, all of this feeling that I had been feeling this whole time, like this whole really weird thing, just kind of lifted. And I felt pretty normal. It was very uh, relieving to feel that, but it just kind of went away. I looked up, and I ended up looking up across the pond, and... I sort of saw the same weird shadowy black thing, but it was going like the opposite way across. Like it was going across the embankment the other way. And so I, I didn't dare like go after it because I mean, I'm obviously the first to die in a horror movie if I do that. But you know, I've seen enough of those to know that I don't need to investigate any further. But anyway, pretty soon after that, trying to process everything that just happened, I go back into the house, right? And the lights are the lights are normal, right? The lights aren't flickering anymore, and I'm relieved about that. Suddenly the light, which I didn't really notice this until this point, but the light levels, you know how the, sometimes there's like less light, more light outside? The light levels suddenly drop, and noises start coming back up. Like I start hearing more and more like the first is just a few birds and then eventually the rustling comes back and all of that um the dogs come back finally i see them outside just running around so i run out there like holy crap the guys are back i look at them and they look actually less dirty than they were when i uh last saw them they're, they're completely unscathed. I brought them inside and I looked them over to make sure nothing happened to them. Because I was like freaking out. But anyway, as I'm looking them over, as I'm finishing up, uh, grandparents pull in. I'm completely relieved at this point. I'm like, holy crap. I help them unload. Um, Grandpa asks why the ATV is out. I say uh, it wasn't starting properly. Couldn't figure out what was wrong. Of course, he goes over there and obviously it starts immediately because that's just how it works. Uh, in stories like this. Um, either way, he notices the gas gauge is low. And he mentions that he wants me to fill it up with gas. I don't even question it at this point. At this point, I'm just like, okay, whatever. As long as I don't have to deal with whatever that was again. I go inside, and Fox News has changed. There's now some other host talking about some other thing. I look at the time. one twenty-seven p.m. So I don't know what the hell happened. I don't know what was going on. All I can tell you is the most paranormal experience I think I've ever had. It's not like the most objectively like where something weird's happening. It was just the most memorable. I think it was just because I was 16 at the time and I really, really, really didn't believe in it. And this is what really pushed me to believe like, okay, something had to have been different about this. But, um... Yeah, I, I apologize for the long-ass story. Um, I just, you know, I wanted to just convey everything that had happened at the time. Um, no, but I do appreciate you giving me the opportunity to tell this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, but uh, keep up the great work, man. Honestly, I love the content you're putting out. I mean, I'm oh, watching every, everything I can, everything I can get my hands on. Loving it. So, uh, yeah, peace, peace. Whoa. That story was incredible. 
<laughs> Sometimes I feel like interjecting even with these audio recordings, and I think I may have a couple times in the past. This time I did not even consider it once. I was just so sucked into the story. There's a couple times the audio paused, and I was just like right at the edge of my seat. Thank you so much, Jason, for the story. Your ability to tell the story was absolutely incredible. One of the best storytellers I think we've had on the show yet. And uh, your voice is good for it too. If you have more stories, I'd love to have you on again. You did say it was long. This is, uh, I guess, where Gregory has to put his foot down. His story is about 16 minutes long. That's great. Um, let's say, yeah, 15 minute limit, you know, more or less on these stories. I think that's perfect. There are so many details of what happens in this story. I can't even list them all. It's like all of reality was gaslighting you. God, I definitely am going to listen to that story again when I go back and edit this because the details were just so perfect the dogs running off and a lack of continuity in events and then a time skip or a time jump or whatever, hearing voices, <laughs> all of this. At one point, you're like, I think it's all tied back to the water. And I'm just like, what is there, LSD in the water? Did you drink the water? <laughs> I, I don't want to sit here and like pick apart details of the story because it is like a very personal account. And it's not like a... A debating whether or not Sasquatch existed kind of thing. This is just like a very personal account. But the story is just so perfect that I will say the old Art Bell thing that I think I say at least once in every episode. This story is a perfect example for you guys in future stories before you send it in. Make sure that your story is true. And if it's not true, it better be convincing. <laughs> thank you so much, Jason. And thank you for kissing my ass. Uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs> You're too kind. All right, I have a story from Not A Crow. It's a bit of a long story, but I think I've got the voice for it. Hi, Greg. I hope you are doing well. I rediscovered your channel about a month ago. Used to love your skeptic videos back when I was in school and was pretty excited to see that your content had went the same way as my interests. Wow, that's very interesting. I actually noticed in my last video, I literally made a video trying to convince people that the fallen angel myths were based on truth. And not only that, but that the gods of that time were represented as fish. And to think that the armored skeptic of like five years ago would have made that is just insane. But I found so many commenters that were like fully on board with the idea that YouTube literally tells me with some of you, not everyone, but some people it decides to tell me. And it's like been a subscriber for five years. It's just like, how? How have you guys followed me on this journey? I'm so honored. I'm so honored that you guys not only stuck around, but that you enjoy the content still, and you're getting the same thing out of it that I am. It's so beautiful. Anyways, he says, enough chit-chat. Oh, goddamn, sorry. <laughs> he says, I have a story for you. I have a pretty normal family. There is my grandparents, my parents my uncles, my aunt, and my other aunt, who dreams of people in graveyards and burial clothes the day before they die. My cousins, and of course me. I love that. <laughs> oh my God, that was so fucking funny. You just list very normal people, and then you're just like, yeah, and then my grandma that dreams about people in their burial clothes the day before they die, and then my cousins. <laughs> that was perfect fucking comic timing. Thank you for that. <laughs> for as long as I remember, I've had an active imagination. I used to create stories and daydream and had quite a few imaginary friends that I hung out with every day. That's interesting. I had imaginary friends too. 
I lived uh, on a property that was separated from my neighborhood. I wasn't allowed to cross the street to hang out with my friends, so... You know, as a child, does. But the thing about me is that even after all those years, at the age of 24, I still have imaginary friends. Ooh, intrigue. Dun dun dun. It took me an embarrassingly long time to find out that this wasn't normal. To be honest, it was such a big part of my experience that I'm still half convinced that it is normal and everyone is just too embarrassed to admit it. Oh, oh, you're gaslighting me now. Okay. <laughs> this is interesting, interesting angle. Okay, I was not expecting to be challenged this way tonight. But I'm here for it. Bring it on, crow. This is this this is exactly what I was talking about. You guys bring me the most amazing shit. Like I did not wake up this morning thinking, "Oh, I'm going to be challenged on whether or not imaginary friends should be normal for adults." <laughs> but here I am. For a while I put it down as Maladaptive daydreaming. That's an interesting idea. I have so many of the traits that would fit that criteria. I have a whole world full of characters and events and stories inside my head. I call it my mind place and I spend a significant amount of my time in there. Even when I'm not in it, I have some of the elements with me as I go through my day-to-day -day life. So as I'm reading this, I'm just trying to think how I have similar ideas in my head. Because being a creative person, I'm in my head all day too. And I'm, the way that I do my series, like obviously my history series, I'm putting myself in it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to make it a very vivid reality that we can sort of imagine is real and I'm constantly putting myself in that reality like I have a place in it and I suppose that sort of qualifies as me imagining another reality and living in it ooh ooh <laughs> okay interesting these all fit into the clinical definition of the condition oh interesting so I thought of it as yet another addition to my extensive portfolio of genetic and psychological misfortunes. But one element never fit the scientific explanation as far as I tried. It even got bolder and bolder the more I tried to deny it or explain it away. These daydreams, they seem divinatory in nature. Okay. Again, trying to think about how this relates to me. I suppose that I have epiphanies, also creative ones, and ones related to my history series that, I don't know, maybe seem so brilliant or so out of my nature to think of that it does seem almost as if they are given to me. I do debate that as well. He continues, let me explain. I started noticing them when the interactions I had in my head somehow kept leaking into the real world. Ooh, so you think maybe precognitions here. I wonder. People said things and did things my friends in my head said and did the day before. Interesting. And when I put that off as some sort of collective wisdom, the elements from my world started appearing in TV and games. Wild. Well, it's possible, playing devil's advocate here, it's possible that the reality you've created in your head subconsciously fits themes that exist already in media, and media tends to reflect other media. For example, the hero's journey is prevalent in stories. It's it exists in most modern stories. I still kept trying to explain it away, but about two years ago, something happened that I couldn't explain nor deny. This part gets a bit dark and has some uncomfortable themes. 
I sometimes have this impulse to make a copy of real people inside my world. Usually it comes from a protective or nurturing instinct. When I see someone in distress, this happened a few months ago when I saw a story on the local news about a murder. A man was killed and cut to pieces by his own father. He said his son was an addict and he wasn't moving out or finding a job. So he murdered him, as you do. When I saw the picture of the victim, I instantly got the urge to bring him into my world. I rationalized it as trying to cope with the horrifying news and decided to bring him in. After a few minutes, we began talking. He was weary and sad, but he was friendly. He said he had never done drugs in his life. And he had told me his dad wanted him gone because he used to be abusive to him when he was a child. Okay. So you bring this person into your head and he starts confiding in you. You feel like you're giving him some sort of a, a nurturing presence by doing this. I guess my equivalent to this would be that when my friends are sick or in trouble, I imagine what I would do if I was there or how I could help. I often wish I was there, especially when, uh, you know, it's something very serious and I'm very helpless, especially with the distance. A lot of my, well, almost all my friends live far away. But I, I can't say I've ever done that with anybody that wasn't outside of my friend group or influence group I guess and definitely never to somebody that is dead he continues I found that strange because those are not normally the topics I would choose to have conversations about what I found even stranger was the report that came out less than a week after in an interview with the victim's sister she had revealed that the father had been abusive to both of them as children threatening to kill them if they told anyone. Also, the autopsy had shown the drugs in his blood were administered after death. Wild. Wild. Well, that is interesting. It does sort of sound like you brought his soul into your mind, or at least made contact with his mind. I wonder. Or maybe you, again, had precognition. And that's just how it's communicated to you. That's how the idea comes to you. Like you said, perhaps divination. Divinatory, as you put it. Because I was having this conversation just the other day. That that's sort of how it's like with, in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Cisco talks to these elders. And they're very poetic in the way they communicate with him. They do it in riddles. And it's because... They can only really get concepts across. They can't really communicate specific instructions. And it seems like a lot of people that are into divination describe it that way. The stuff, I guess, that I feel I get that I wonder if is divine, as it were, is really elusive and vague. The way it works out in reality is always just a... It's similar to the way I'm shown, but it's not the same. It's like a, a representation of it. Like, again, sort of like a riddle. So he continues. At this point, I'm kind of freaked out. I hate not knowing what's going on, so I decided to experiment with this. Whatever it is. I started meditating and trying out some divination techniques. I managed to predict two deaths in the family down to the person and the month and the same minor things that felt too bizarre to be coincidence, but not worth mentioning here. While two deaths is pretty fucking significant, there's nothing really you can follow up after that. That's pretty wild, if true. The bizarreness didn't end there. In July, I was hanging out with one of my childhood friends. We talked and watched some movies, and eventually she fell asleep. I decided to stay on the couch and keep watching the movie so I wouldn't wake her up. The movie was almost over when she woke up with a gasp. 
I asked her if she had a nightmare. She had. I couldn't sleep for two days when she told me what she had seen, but not out of fear. She had dreamed of being stuck in a room. A room she described in detail, down to the style of the windows and the carvings of the headboards in the bed. The room I have in my mind place. Whoa. Okay. Keep in mind, I never talk to anyone about my mind plays. No one who knows me in real life has a clue that I even experience these things, let alone the details. I don't... <laughs> yeah, I, I want to remind you guys that if you guys want to be anonymous, I always oblige. I do not want anyone's names to get out if you don't want your names to be heard because obviously stories like this this is very revealing and it's absolutely incredible that we get a glimpse into someone else's mind like this especially when their mind is so unique i've never heard of someone that experiences life like this before this is by definition the strange and unexplained so crow continues I don't know what to make of all of this. Is it the beginning stages of insanity? Has somebody left the Akashic Records tap running? Is the fabric of reality unraveling? Is this my X-Men supervillain origin story? I haven't gotten a clue. Well, I find really interesting, though, that a lot of the things that you've described, a lot of the experiences that I've sort of have my own versions of each of those and I have similar experiences that you've had at least complementary experiences that you've had and, and it, you got me thinking about that side of my brain in a way that I've never really I've never really thought much about it before and now you've got me really curious you guys have to keep sending me stuff like this keep challenging me like this bring me ideas ask me questions i've never been asked before i get off on this guys <laughs> i love this shit if you've gotten this far thank you for reading i hope you enjoyed it if so keep an eye out i might write you some of my encounter stories as well best regards crow well thank you so much i really really appreciate that this is from Tyler. Hello, Greg. Oh, this is a follow-up, actually, to somebody else's story from Cat. He says, Hearing Cat's possible alien abduction story reminded me of a couple of my experiences. Wow, that's wild. Yeah, that's cool. You guys are listening to previous episodes and sort of bouncing off of each other's ideas. That makes this series feel very alive. I've always been interested in aliens, but with a healthy dose of skepticism. When I was 17, I vividly remember waking up one night just after 3 a.m. I sat up in my bed and looked at the window. The brightest light I've ever seen filled the room. It didn't hurt my eyes, but the whole room was pure white. And when it was gone, I turned back and looked at the clock again, and it was 3.30 a.m., Wow, big time skip. 17 years old when this happened. Wow. That's amazing. So that perfectly fits the description. That I think I've talked about this in previous episodes. I, oh, you know what it was? It was in, I think, in the Rendlesham Forest video on the main channel. I talk about this one kind of alien abduction encounter where it's the reality around you changes, which... Maybe not to the same extreme that the first story described, but more like, yeah, like a room forms around you. And then when the room unforms around you and you're back in normal space-time reality, time has skipped one way or another. It felt like I never moved, but somehow I lost half an hour in a matter of seconds. I personally don't know if it was an extremely vivid dream but I can normally tell after. I've had lucid dreams and sleep paralysis, but this was different. Normally, in dreams, I can't feel any physical sensation, but I remember touching my blanket. 
I'm still not sure what to make of it. I've also had sleep paralysis, but I can always move if I want to. The most recent example was just after I had gotten engaged. I woke up with an immense weight on my chest and an almost overwhelming feeling of fear. Yeah, that's a ba- that's a sleep paralysis experience to a T you just described. Something sitting on your chest and you are terrified. And that is your state. Pure panic. A black shape was in the corner of the room. I knew exactly what was happening, but I don't get scared easily in normal life, and this kind of animalistic fear was new to me, and I kind of liked it. Is that weird? Oh my god, you're chasing the high of a sleep paralysis experience? You're a goddamn legend, Tyler. Yeah, that is weird, but yeah, that's fun. So that last detail, a shadow in the corner, some sort of figure in the corner, that is the other symptom. Those three things you just described is the classic sleep paralysis experience. You feel like something is sitting on your chest, then you're also just in a panic state. You're just afraid. Like you wake up and you're already afraid. And you see a figure in the corner of the room. Sometimes it's even moving. Sometimes it looks at you. It has eyes. Sometimes on rare occasion it even talks. And all of that you know, the explanation for that clinically is that's your fight or flight response going haywire while you're still in a semi dream state. And like I've described in previous ghost videos, ghost encounters are almost always related to fight or flight responses triggering. And doing that tells your brain that something is coming for you. So your brain necessitates that that something exists. So it's possible that it is your brain creating that figure because it demands that that thing that exists be somewhere. So it is creating it there. That is very possible. But also the fact that all of these sleep paralysis experiences are that textbook that they're literally exactly to the T what you just described. You could also argue perhaps they are literally deities doing this entities doing this the strange thing is that i could move any part of my body and as soon as i do the feeling vanishes that was the first time i saw something the only time i've felt anything like that outside of sleep paralysis was the one time i dropped acid <laughs> spectacular spectacular yeah, I think that's interesting that you can voluntarily decide when to move, and when you do that, it knocks you out of it. It's almost like you've discovered this sort of buzz or high or whatever that you can reach as long as you can sort of stay in the zone. I wonder if you can learn to evoke that because that, that I think, is perhaps the next stage. You know, if it's an experience that you can control like that and one that you can sort of revel in, perhaps you can encourage them to happen. And you can get better at them, almost like a form of lucid dreaming. It's like lucid demon interactions. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not condoning that. <laughs> Anyways, he finishes off by saying, I had a couple more strangest stories but they're not as interesting to me as these two. I would appreciate it if this was read, and thank you for your time. Wow, thank you so much, Tyler. That is spectacular. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me tonight. This has been a spectacular episode. I know I've got a couple more uh, Super Chats to read here before my voice goes, and then I'm going to let you all get to bed. It's one 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 a.m. God bless you beautiful people. Lucid Delusions. Thank you for the super chat. No message. Uh, the Ellis. God, Ellis, you've been way too generous tonight. Another super chat. Thank you for the hippopotamus with the Macaulay Culkin surprised from Home Alone look. That's, that's what you sent me. Thank you. 
Money well spent. And Tevis, oh, good to see you're here today, Tevis. You always end up making it before the end of the show. Thank you for the super chat, Tevis. He says, come down to Seattle and go on a Sasquatch hunt with me. Ha ha. Seriously, though, I'm glad you're doing well. Thanks for doing these regularly again, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tevis. I know that I've got a couple of fans floating around the Seattle area, and I've got a couple of buddies around there, too. Well, I've got, I know I have one friend in southern Washington and one in northern Oregon. Seattle can't be too far from there. But I want to do a whole tour of the Pacific Northwest, uh, Sasquatch country. There's a bunch of areas there that are like notoriously supernaturally dense. A lot of uh, shadow people like we just discussed. Uh, ghost activity. I've got a lot of buddies in the Washington area that do different spooky ghost shit. So I'm, yeah, I'm down. Sasquatch Hunt is on the list. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me, everybody. I love you guys. And I'll catch you next time on the next episode of Full Metal Tuxedo. Have a good night.